maybe like our view, our listenership is going to go up like tenfold because of this, you know, social distancing, man. People are going to be like, man, I've listened to every sports podcast out there. What's left? Two unqualified idiots. Sign me up. So that's so that should be our new our new logo. It's like when everything else has been exhausted, there's this. Hey. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> you are listening to episode forty five of the Unnecessary Nonsense podcast. I'm Carlos Algazar, and I'm practicing social distancing, which in this case basically means I'm too lazy to go outside on a Saturday. With me is this sometimes this case, Dave Turbo. Uh, coming at you live from my uh, social distancing. It's going well so far. It's been one day. Wow. I, I love that. I love that your your intro was to basically steal my joke and perform it worse than I did. All right. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. So decent joke and lame joke aside, we're going to get into uh, talking a little bit about this because it, if you're talking about sports or anything else right now, like there's really nothing else. Uh, it's basically coronavirus or you can stare at the ceiling. These are your choices. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. We're not going to be completely down on it. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a lightheartedness. However, one quick thing I want to, do, want to do off the top before we get into the main topics is I want to say really quickly, uh, my perspective on it is very simply this. And hysteria and being hysterical about it is stupid. It is counterproductive. It's pointless. However, you should take it with a modicum of seriousness. And modicum of seriousness means just don't be reckless and just consider that for the vast populace, there will be a fair number of people who will, at some point during the course of time, uh, contract the, the virus itself. For most people, it is non-fatal. That's 100% true. But at the same time, there are enough people for who it would be a very serious thing where you don't want to basically hit them with it all at the same time. You want to have them to have the ability to get help if they need it. And that's really what we're talking about. Perfectly healthy, younger people. It's not so much for you. It's for the folks that can't that are going to need the help. And you're going to want to make sure they can get it when they actually need it. So that's really what we're talking about here. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy out there and a lot of uh, mass hysteria. I just want to let everyone know I have not been hoarding toilet paper. I'm not one of those people. So, And also, it's like I'm not worried because, one, most toilet paper is made in Canada. And two, if you really need it that badly, just have a shower. That's uh, that's some sound advice by you, Dave. Uh, the, the one that I enjoyed was the hoarding of hand sanitizer. I got a kick out of that one because here's the thing. There is value. So just so we can dispel, uh, this isn't a medical podcast. I'm not a medical professional and I only, play one, I. On, I only play one on TV. But the thing is that... Really? That was you playing house? You have no idea. Uh, makeup does tremendous things, Dave. The point is that... When it comes to that, like there is actually a useful utility to it, but I should, and this was something that I, I'll give you a quick story, Dave. And this is where we're going to talk about a little bit of levity along with the seriousness. So the seriousness is take it seriously. Don't be a jerk, whatever. That's, that's all hundred percent true. Don't, don't be Rudy Gobert. Correct. But uh, let's give you a little bit of a little bit of levity here. Uh, and this was a, this was a true thing. So I went down. Uh, I was still right up until this Friday. I was still working in the office, and then we made decisions to make that to make that change because I'm in a position where I can work from home. I can work remotely. Now that is an option. We activated that option. But I also work as a contractor, so I had to kind of balance the two things out. I have family at home who would be who would do very poorly if they were to get sick with this, so I wanted to be cognizant of that. But at the same time, I also work as a contractor. So if I don't go to work and I don't work, I don't get paid. So up until basically this week, we didn't have the ability to get on the network unless we were in one of the buildings where the network was. So I was going to pitch them anyway on getting access to the network remotely so that I could have that option if and when they flipped the switch and made the decision to do that. Well, it all kind of came together on Friday, and uh, this is kind of comparable kind of to how quickly things happened with the NBA example. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But in like the real-life day-to-day example, on, at the beginning of the day on Friday, they approached us. They, they were thinking about the exact same thing, which was great, uh, and they basically said, hey, let's, let's get you guys applied for the, the network access, the remote network access, just so that we're prepared. And that was right in the morning, first thing on Friday. Well, by the afternoon, just after lunch, the official word came down from HR basically saying, if you can and if you have the access and can do your job from home, then do it from home. And all travel between even outside, of obviously, but also travel between offices. So stay to your home office if you are going to go into the office. Stick to your home office. And policies like that are being laid down all over the place. So by the end of the day on Friday, we knew, number one, we had access to the network. But number two, the expectation was starting Monday, you're working from the house. You're doing teleconferencing, whatever you have to do. Business doesn't stop, but we had to make adaptations. But talking about the same Friday, 
I went downstairs to go and check out the situation was because basically I work in a tower that's near basically the mall is the main floor. So I go down there to go check out the supermarket just to see what the situation is. Obviously, it's getting kind of busy. A lot of folks are there and kind of playing into what Dave was talking about. You had a bu- you had a bunch of people filling up their carts and doing whatever. And I was like, ah, it's not really that bad in Canada that you have to be trying to freak out already. But what I noticed, obviously, uh, to, to Dave's point, toilet paper obviously is you know sold out everywhere because people are freaking out about it. And I still don't completely understand the obsession with toilet paper on this one. What I will say, the other one that obviously was sold out in there and the pharmacy as well is hand sanitizer. And I get it, but I should make a point here for everybody. And this is kind of important. Hand sanitizer serves a very legitimate purpose here to obviously disinfect your hands and you know prevent you from uh, spreading the thing. But just so we're clear, for those of you that are buying hand sanitizer, just tend to send it home. Hand sanitizer makes sense in an office because you put it in all kinds of places all around the office so that people can sanitize their hands throughout. But the thing is, when you're at home, and, and this is why I was saying it was funny to me, Dave, you know what was still on the shelf available in the pharmacy, which I picked up uh, one when I was down there on Friday? Antibacterial soap? Yes, soap. And I was like, guys, the hand sanitizer is good. It's a good measure. But you know what's even better when you're at home? Antibacterial soap. So the fact that you didn't sell out that one is like, maybe you're not thinking about this the right way. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, some of it's just dumb. And and uh, I mean, most a lot of it is, right? Yeah. And the, it was funny to me, though, be from the beginning of the week to the end of the week, is that at the beginning of the week, and this is how I know that people aren't that educated, Dave. From the beginning of the week, uh, one of the things that there was still a lot of, and, uh, and I, I didn't think to buy a couple for myself, was if you really are obsessed with hand sanitizer, well, then I have a suggestion for you if it's not already sold out because I think finally somebody clued in. Hand sanitizer is predominantly isopropylene alcohol. It's, right. it's Just rubbing, by rubbing alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, you, you can basically water it down a little bit, and that's hand soap. Sorry, that's or, uh, you yeah, know, hand sanitizer. Or mix it with some like aloe vera gel or something like that. That's basically what – that is basically – when you guys buy hand sanitizer, that's basically what you're buying. And up until a little while ago, you could have bought as much freaking rubbing alcohol as you wanted to. You could have bought it by the damn gallon. It's just – So takeaway number one, stop being ridiculous, people. And for take number two, if you failed remedial science, then for God's sake, l- learn what things are. It says right on it. It's rubbing alcohol with a gel mixed in. That's all it is. So stop, stop being nuts and stop freaking out about that. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm throwing out there. Also sage advice. Yeah, it, it, but it's silliness. It was, uh, that's why I want, like I said, we want to be a combination of, you know, be aware of what the reality is, but also with a little bit of lightheartedness. It just made me laugh that the rubbing alcohol wasn't sold out until much later when I think somebody flipped the switch and go, wait a minute. This is the same product in greater volume. What? And I was like, yeah. you, and, I, and I just stood there and I'm like, you guys are idiots. You're all morons. The other thing that that gets me is the people that are are making so much money off selling, like reselling things they bought. Oh, I'm gonna. Did you hear? There's a a couple. I think they're out, just outside of Toronto somewhere. Somewhere I was in Canada, so I'm pretty sure it was in Ontario. That they bought seventy seventy thousand dollars worth of Lysol wipes. You know, like the like the you know you know what I mean when I say Lysol wipes, right? Yeah, the antibacterial wipes basically yeah. you take them off. And- they bought seventy thousand dollars worth of them, and they've made over a hundred thousand dollars in profit. Now, I haven't looked at the container of Lysol wipes in a while, but isn't basically the wipes um, aren't they effectively just doused in uh, alcohol? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say is we're, we're if you if you're noticing, there's a theme here. There's an underlying ingredient to these products that that was readily available in quite abundance. Is all I'm trying to say. It's alcohol. Rubbing Not the alcohol. drinking kind. See. Yeah, I was going to say, people are going to start freaking pour, pouring beer over everything, being like, hey, but that won't work because it needs to be at least 60% alcohol for it to actually work. Exactly. Just, you know. Exactly. And uh, I, I did laugh, though, because one of the other things, like I said, I'll give you some uh, anecdotes because that's all we can do with a lot of this stuff, is um, uh, my brother works at LCBO which is the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Uh, and I was waiting to see how long it would take for there to be a bit of a run. And um, one of my uh, one of my colleagues in the office actually had a line that was beautiful, and I shared it with uh, with my family on Friday. And they basically went downstairs, and they didn't bother to go to the supermarket. They didn't bother to go to the pharmacy because that was that was a fool's errand at that point. Uh, but they did. They came back upstairs with an LCBO bag, and then we were all looking at it and going like. And I was just kind of listening on from the distance, and it was like, and somebody was like, "Oh, what did you get?" And then they pulled out the box, and it was a box of whiskey. And they're like, "Oh, you're a whiskey drinker." And he goes, "No, but I will be." <laughs> And I was like, I like your style, sir. I like your style. 
So Roberto actually got me uh, one of the. I, I I sent him a text message earlier in the day because I was going to go get some something anyway. I was like, "Hey, can you get me uh, my Johnny Walker black?" Just so just before any of the idiots go in there rushing trying to grab it all. And he goes, "Yeah, I'll see what I can do." Uh, so he ended up grabbing the bottle for me. But I was like, "But he, but towards the end of the day, he was saying that it got progressively like a lot of folks started taking a lot off." And I was like, "You know, alcohol is kind of expensive." I was kind of surprised that people were some people were trying almost to hoard alcohol. I was like, "Guys, you're not going to sell. You're not going to resell it." Like, I, I'm not sure, you know, th- this is a situation where you can go get it in orderly fashion. Just go get what you need and what you'd like and move on. Yeah, but the problem is there's there are enough people out there who would buy it, like the resell, right? Like if people are, people are paying like $350 for a package of toilet paper, Carlos. I believe it. I believe it. You know? Yeah. But the thing is like, like newspaper people, if it comes to it. There you go. So, so finally, you're saying we finally have a use for the Mississauga News? Correct. Oh, it's been 30 years. We finally found one. One use for that damn thing. Other than the whole is basic other than as being as a flyer envelope. But anyway, so that's kind of the situation in kind of the Toronto GTA area currently. It's not super crazy to be honest. Let's not be let's not over paint the picture. Most people are kind of conducting their day-to-day business in a conventional way, but there is little you'll see little pockets of absolute silliness and it's there, definitely there. Um and I've seen enough of it the last week or so that it's like, well, the situation is not going to get better from the perspective of people being stupid, uh, which is unfortunate. That's that's the real problem in in this case. It's just people not thinking. But uh, look, taking it back to the sports realm a little bit, the first real kind of example that we saw of, you know, the quick escalation of things, because I use the example of that Friday where we started off with the idea we were starting to make mitigating strategies. But then immediately became, all right, guys, so we're we're not shutting everything down, but we're moving all of you, you know, stay in your lane, stay in your area, and it'll be better for everybody. And that decision was made very quickly over the course of hours where a lot of deliberation had been done for sure. But once the switch was flipped, that was it. It was uh, everybody knew what was going on. That basically is what played out on Wednesday. And Wednesday was kind of an interesting day for the NBA uh, because up until that point, the discussion had been centering around the idea that they were going to play in empty arenas. And then, uh, of course, they had, they had uh, limited access to reporters uh, to be in the locker room. So the idea was to try to prevent one of the players from getting contracting it. Because as soon as a player contracts it, well, now immediately you're like, everyone you're in contact with, the other team, the team's uh, coaching staff, the trainers, everybody who's on the plane with the team flying back and forth. And any other teams you played and then teams that they played and so on and so forth. Immediately, you have to consider, even if a bunch of other people test negative, you have to consider everybody who potentially could have come in contact with. Yeah, and that's exactly what we saw, thanks to Mr. Gobert. Yeah, exactly. And the big thing with the Rudy Gobert thing, now there's two parts. So I'll get to Gobert in one second. But I'm going to ask you this. When did you first hear about the NBA postponing the season? The actual hearing of they postponed the season, whether you had the reason right away or not. I'm trying to remember if I was I was either at work or I was it was at night. I can't remember though, because it all came at you so fast. I think it was in the evening, but I can't remember. Like, like I got it fair enough. Like whenever whenever the notification came through the phone, mm-hmm. that's when I got it. Right. So the interesting thing about the way that played out is, in reality, the big moves happened within a couple of hours. Because really, like I said, right up until that point, the idea had been the planning. The you know the owners had been talking and the commissioner with the commissioner and everybody had been discussing the idea of. How do we make this work with empty arenas? What can we do? How can we... The idea was to try to keep the games going as long as they thought they could get away with it without causing any problems. And then obviously what happened was uh, during the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, Utah Jazz game, that's when you had a person from the medical staff run out and basically say that Rudy Gobert had tested positive, which immediately shut put a kibosh on the whole thing. Like they were just about to go to tip off. That's how close they were because it was uh, kind of an immediately fluid situation. But it created this weird situation in the arena where the fans didn't know. First, it was a delay. Like, they didn't just shut down the game immediately when he ran out. It was like he needed to tell everybody what was going on. And they needed to kind of talk amongst themselves. And it created a delay of about, I think it was about 30 minutes. So the initial report was just the game start has been, you know, postponed for a couple of minutes. And it became about 30 minutes before uh, they were finally able to say, like, all right, this game is sh- this game is canceled. You know, basically, like, everybody, go home. And then as more reports come in, you start getting, okay, Rudy Gobert is tested, has presumptively tested positive, And as a result, now they're going to do this. The teams have to stay in the hotels. And like things moved one quick one after another, bang, bang, bang. And once that uh, became clear, then the NBA came out shortly thereafter and is basically saying the season has been postponed. They haven't canceled it, but the season has definitely been postponed. And all of that stemmed from uh, basically 
you know, one presumptive case, which you knew was going to happen. And then obviously since then, Donovan Mitchell has also uh, tested positive. And that was basically what they were afraid of. Because as soon as you got one, the likelihood of another person uh, getting it was much higher. Now, adding to that a layer of complexity to it, now we'll bring Rudy Gobert back into this. Because part of the problem isn't just that Rudy Gobert contracted the virus and then you know, spread it to another person. It's also the fact that from the Utah Jazz perspective and the team perspective, they were kind of recipients of the same thing that Rudy Gobert had been showing prior to that, where there was a famous viral video of him not taking it seriously when he was asked about it prior to being diagnosed with it. And he was just kind of touching the floor, touching the table, touching the microphone and really not taking it seriously at all. And then part of that was apparently that also extended to the locker room where Rudy Gobert was kind of messing with people's stuff. And other players were a little bit more concerned about it, and they weren't too thrilled about his cavalier attitude, which now, ironically, he gets to be patient zero in the NBA for that situation. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, obviously, the, when you see that video of him touching all the microphones and everything, you're, you're like, wow, this didn't age well, and very quickly didn't age well. It didn't take long. But, you know, the thing I, f- I find interesting about the NBA and all the other sports leagues, that, well, not all the other sports leagues, but one in particular, which which we'll get to, my version of the pretentious cost cutting running report this week as it ties into this whole uh, COVID-19. Well, we have contingency plans. We're, we're thinking about it. But it was it once it, you know, no real concrete action took place until a player was sick. Mm-hmm. Right. And then it was concrete action. And you look that um, I don't know if you saw this. Um, a fan, a Boston Celtics fan contracted the virus that they think they caught from a player. Now, they're not saying that it's Rudy Gobert or uh, Donovan Mitchell, but it, it's, you know, we're thinking it's probably one of the two of them because the, the Celtics have played the Jazz within that 14-day period, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but I think it's just, it's just, I think it's the right decision. I think the way things are, you know, the writing was on the wall and, and you know, as you saw, once the NBA made that decision, all the other major sports leagues in, uh, in North America made the same decision. Well, when I say North America, I mean Canada and the United States. Uh, made the same decision. I think the only thing that's still happening, correct me if I'm wrong, is NASCAR, uh, but it's going on in closed stadiums. Yeah. Is there exactly. anything else you are aware of that is actually and UFC? Yeah, UFC was one of the ones that came out and basically said they would play in like a closed arena space because the UFC Brazil, as we're recording this you, uh, on Saturday evening, UFC Brazil is actually happening right now. Um, and as a bunch of suspensions and closings of uh, different leagues happened, uh, you know, UFC was. I think I think the reason UFC was able to go through it well, there's two parts. Dana White still likes money. Um, he does have a captive audience because realistically, that's the only live sporting event that I'm aware of in North America happening right now. So they've got all the eyeballs. And um, the other aspect of it, though, is that by the time this became this really accelerated into its current moment, um, a bunch of the fighters are already in Brazil. So it's like uh, they're already there. So. You know, once the fighters disperse and go back to their native countries or wherever, if they come back to the U.S. or whatever the case is, right now there's um, there's going to be a lot more cases that are going to come out of the U.S. So it's not like you know going home right now for a lot of these fighters is going to pres- potentially make them safer. They may have to go into self isolation or quarantine or whatever. And most likely, when they get off the plane, they're going to be asked to. So it's one of those things where either way it was going to happen. So Dana White does get. A, I'm not give. I'm not going to give him a pass. But if he wants to use a justification that well. Already all our personnel, everybody are already over there and we'll do the closed arena thing. And as soon as everybody gets home, they'll have to get tested and whatever. And then we'll figure out what's going to happen from there. That can be your sort of out if you want to use it for Dana White, just because they're completely in another another part of the world. Well, fair enough. Another part of the world that does have COVID-19. For sure. But like the entire world has it at the moment. Well, no, for sure. I'm, but the, the point is that I think if you're going to minimize risk, the, the easiest way to minimize risk is to not do things, right? And and you know what I mean? Like UFC like is a, is a thing where, you know, there's going to be close contact between obviously the, the people fighting as well as the as the referees. Are you suggesting that right? when fighters bleed on each other, this is a concern of yours? Well, I don't know. I don't know if you can actually catch the virus that way, but... I, You're going to sweat I mean, on each like, other, though. But they're exactly. They're going to sweat on each other, right? There's lots of things. That can happen in a fight. And post fight hugs. Post fight hugs could, are a big thing. Yeah. That could lead you to to get sick. Right? Yeah. Um I think it's kind of dumb. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're gonna survive without sports for as long as it, they're gonna come back eventually. Right? You just need to right, right now what you should do is go the route of the Phoenix Suns. Have you heard what they're doing? I have not. Go ahead. 
So they are going to continue their schedule, but they're going to play it on NBA 2K and stream it on Twitch, which is apparently like an app that you stream like yourself playing video games. Oh my God, you don't know what Twitch is? No. Amazing. All right, can I educate you on Twitch, Dave? Please do. Yeah. Hopefully I'm, you will educate a listener as well, and I'm not the only one who doesn't know what Twitch is. Well, you are an 85-year-old man. You're, 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 like, you're like half the age of Kazoo. But, uh, you know, still. The thing is... It is. It's, it's not just an app. It's also a site. It, think of it as being originally, you're right. Originally, it was predominantly a video game streaming platform. Think of basically YouTube but for streaming. They operate their UI a little differently, but it's the same concept. You put it on. Now, the thing is you can have it as an app on your phone, on an Xbox, on a bunch of streaming boxes. So you can have it. Basically, uh, 24 hours a day, there are folks streaming all over the world. It focuses more on the streaming aspect, whereas YouTube focuses more on the you recorded a video and upload it. With the streaming one, you ha- they have their own platform set up, and Amazon, I believe, owns them now. So basically, what they can do is, you can you can set up your your setup, play games, and then interact with your audience through chat and all that. So, like I said, it is an online streaming platform, and what it really comes down to, and where a lot there's a lot of uh, popularity with it, is that a lot of the younger kids and generations are a lot more interested and engaged in that form of uh, viewing and interaction because you can interact with the streamer. And they can respond to comments and do whatever, and they can set up different ways of um, doing. So it becomes its own kind of entertainment, but with an interactive element. And that's what's helped a lot of the – there are some streamers who actually make a lot of money um, because they do play ads throughout the course of it. And you can rewatch sometimes a stream where you'll get ads, again, money, and then uh, people can donate money to the streamer. So in turn, they can earn revenue that way. So there's a bunch of different little ways. And one of the things that Amazon did is they combined Amazon Prime with it where they said, well, actually, you can uh, subscribe to a streamer every month with your Amazon Prime subscription and they will kick in the subscription fee. So if you're subscribed, you can watch. Anybody can watch any of these streamers doing their thing. But if you subscribe to them, you're basically giving them $5 a month of which half goes to the streamer directly and half goes to the platform. So if you've got a lot of subscribers, there's you, that's actually direct money in your pocket. Yeah. Okay. So there's Not a bad. there's a whole infrastructure built on that. It's one of those things where like if you're into it, uh, people watch it. And one of the things I can tell you is it's not just video games, Dave. There are a lot of online poker players who do streaming through Twitch. Okay. And Twitch has also started getting into the live streaming of other things because um, when they had E3s and such, and the video game companies were doing their streams, sometimes they would have the streaming on Twitch. So like I said, just think of it as a streaming focused platform as opposed to YouTube being a download a video of whatever. But Twitch has opened up a, a little bit the amount of topics it can cover. So it's not just necessarily focused only on video games. All right. Good to know. So now you know. But yeah. I mean, it's obviously like to me, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to play FIFA and I'm going to you know play 2K now because that's how I'm going to get my sports fix. Although, thankfully, I have a couple of games PBR'd that I haven't watched yet. Uh, that I don't know the result. Not uh, the soccer games, not basketball games. But at least I have something. But you know what? It's just kind of one of those things that it's it's nice that the you know they're doing something to sort of still give the fans something. Now they haven't said whether it's play who's going to be playing you know the controls or if they're going to um, I think if you know sim the it. game or whatever. I don't know, but you know it's still hey you know what it's basically it's the next best thing. I honestly think you could get away with if they were smart. I would I would have like a rotating thing because if if any of the players already have like a decent setup and a camera that could connect to the internet, um, the players could totally you could have different players from the team do it, and uh, they could and then you'd have the chat. Well, yeah, and I mean I mean you, the way you can you could set it up that you know they can still be isolated. One person could be here, one person could be there, and you can still do it. That's what I mean. You know what I mean? Like it, so, why not? The players have enough money where the equipment requirement is not so onerous that the team could be like, they don't have to pay them for it, but I'm saying they could encourage them and be like, hey, you know what? This is something. It's better than nothing. And you can, and it gives you a unique opportunity to interact with the players a little bit. You can ask questions and stuff while they're playing the game, and you know they can be doing it that way. That is totally something that can be done. At the end of the day, Dave, I would put it this way. I just think about. I would say think about it in this manner, everybody. Um, at the end of the day, sports is an entertainment product. You can choose to a certain degree what you deem or find entertaining. So you can find entertainment in different avenues and different formats. What you're really getting right now is 
It's unfortunate that things have to shut down this way, but it also gives you an opportunity to explore maybe some other things you haven't considered in terms of where you get your entertainment. You know, you can, you can take the time to learn something. You can find ways to occupy the time in a way that's still productive. For sure. For sure you can. And, um, I mean, this has the potential really to kind of reshape society in some ways. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of people that if they want to, can, can take this as sort of an opportunity or if you're like, for example, if you're like me and you really have a hard time playing 2k, cause it's so realistic. You can literally do everything you can do on a basketball court and there's a control for it. And you have to try and learn all those controls. You could take the time to actually learn the controls. Hashtag Dave's old. Hey man, truth, but you know. Maybe uh, what we may do in uh, next week's podcast, we'll have to come up with an overall topic. But one of the things that I can explain to you, to Dave, and to the rest of you is that I have a theory known as the Video Game Prime. And, I, and I'll happily explain this concept to you because it is one of my great joys that I, that I torture my younger brother with the fact that he's past his Video Game Prime. Far past. We're all past our Video Game Prime. Oh, 100%. Yeah. But, it, but I actually can explain it better, and I, I'm actually going to save that one for next week because we're going to need something to talk about. But um, I actually have a theory about this. I can actually and, outline my theory. All right. Sounds good. And on that note, I will say for the listeners, we will continue with our MLB previews. Uh, we, you will hear the NL East preview. You weir, will hear the AL East preview. Um, but you'll hear that kind of once we know what's going on and if and when we know when the season is going to start. Yeah, but I just don't we, think there's, a, there's not as much of a sense of urgency. To no, have I to just want people right to know that we're, you know, there's, it's still going to happen. Oh, yes, yes. They really need a scintillating analysis based on reading a, a paragraph or two. Hey, yeah, this guy sounds good. I have no idea who that is. But this guy sounds good. He sounds good. Hey, man, this is the problem is maybe, like, our, view, our listenership is going to go up, like, tenfold because of this, you know, social distancing, man. People are going to be like, man, I've listened to every sports podcast out there. What's left? Two unqualified idiots. Sign me up. So that's so that should be our new our new logo. It's like when everything else has been exhausted, there's this. Hey, yeah, you know what? <laughs> wouldn't be the it, you know wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. That that right there is a ringing endorsement if ever there was one. So that's kind of the aspect of that. Um, there's a couple more that I want to talk about though separately because they're kind of interesting. Um, the thing with the with the suspension uh, and cancellation of various sports is that it affects them differently. And kind of Dave indirectly alluded to this. And one thing that I think is going to be interesting is that. Yes, this is kind of an opportunity, if you choose to look at it that way, of maybe uh, finding other things that you're passionate about that you can focus your attention on for a while. Uh, and then when sports comes back, obviously, you can go back to watching that. But what's going to be interesting is that I think some sports are going to have trouble with it more so than others. And let me explain why. The reason I say so is that if, there's a, if there are some sports that are basically relying on inertia, like people have, are in the habit of watching it all the time rather than have as strong a passionate connection to it as others. Like there's some sports where it's like super passionate, want to watch every game, blah, blah, blah. But then there are other ones where it's like, Oh yeah, it's on. Yeah. I definitely watch it, but you're not as like directly drawn into it. Well, for those ones, you're not going to miss those nearly as much. And if it's one of those things where it comes back in some modified format or it takes a while, they may lose any momentum they have because if they're in the middle of the season and people are like, you know what? I didn't really miss it that much. It was all right. Maybe I'll just watch this other thing because you know, when the sports calendar starts reopening, multiple leagues may start overlapping with each other. And then you're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to be watching this or this? Um, well, if one of them you're more passionate about than the other, well then you've made your decision. Whereas maybe they had a little bit of separation previously. Some sports may not be able to start right away and they may have a longer delay, not so much because of the virus, but because like if they start right in the middle of another sport that is probably more popular, that may hurt them. So they may have to extend the delay even longer than uh, than the virus itself. Yeah. And it's a question of two, like what happens when they when they do come back? Like, look at look at the XFL, for, for example. Right. You know, here's a, a new league that's, you know, gaining in popularity, gaining in viewership. And if it doesn't come back in any form, did they announce if they're going to try and come back? Yeah. So uh, let, let me talk about that because that's my right? bullet point here. So All right, let's let, do it. Let me explain two things. So first, technically it was declining in viewership, but it was increasing in attendance. Let's just make that distinction clear. But okay. the but the declining of viewership is to be expected because right now the, the XFL was oscillating between main networks like uh, ABC or ESPN or whatever. Well, ESPN is a cable network, but still relatively mainstream. And then also when they go into FS1, you know, that's not the same as being Fox proper. That, that makes a big difference 
because Fox proper people can get for their local affiliate. They can get it via the rabbit ears. If that's what they really want to do, it is possible. Um, Obviously, that's that hurt a little bit. So they, the, the ratings were going down, but they seem to have a very passionate core, which is good. You can build off that. So long story short, when they said they were canceling the season, they said their plan is to be back f- and run a full season in 2021. Vince McMahon's original business model was to run a couple of seasons no matter what. But one thing that's going to be interesting is they're going to have to look into it because I think for the most part, the on the field product was fairly successful in season one. They were halfway through the regular season. Uh, P.J. Walker is coming in as a as a MVP candidate, and very likely he may go to the NFL next year. That's, uh, that's looking like a real possibility. And the league made a very smart play in that they basically said all the players are now kind of off the hook because of some of them were, because during the course of the season, they were meant to be exclusive to the XFL. And then there would be a cutoff where they could sign with the NFL or whoever. They basically said, we release you from your, uh, from your requirement. If you can sign on with an NFL team, go for it. You're, you're, you're available to do so if you wish. Um, which is a good move from the player's perspective because you allow them to um, explore other options. The other thing is that they agreed, I believe, I have to go look this one up here, but I believe they also agreed to pay the players for the rest of the season. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I read that, Carlos. That yeah. that's what they said they're going to do. Yeah, and because they basically said like we'll pay you for the other half of the season, and if you're looking at it from the perspective of um, of doing a make a make good, especially to encourage future players to consider playing for the league who may be on the fence, it's it's a good message to send. Like you know what, this wasn't what we were planning on, but you're all here, so we'll pay you. We'll pay you with what's left over, and it gives them an immediate contract with the AAF. Where as soon as uh, Tom Dundon shut it down, he's basically like all of you get out, but. We're kicking you out of the hotel too, and get home however you get home. It's it's a bad message to send because that was the way he closed down the league. But the XFL is saying we intend to play next year, so we don't want to alienate you guys. So we'll get you home, and here's your here's the rest of your money. Which honestly, I think is is a the right thing to do. It sends a good message. the The, the bottom line is it means if you intend to be viable for next year and you are going to come back, I think it's a good message. It leaves the players with a good taste in their mouth leaving. And if they do decide to come back, then they at least can feel comfortable that they were treated well on the way out. Yeah, absolutely. So that can be helpful. Um, as we get further along, we'll talk more XFL at some point. Obviously, there's not too much to update now. Although uh, there was a player um, on the Seattle Dragons who was tested positive uh, for coronavirus. So that's obviously going to be a big thing. Um, it's going to be related to any of the players on the Seattle team and all that. But this is basically what it's going to be. Um, we can't act shocked about it because right now the biggest issue the U S has is they don't have enough tests to test all the people to really understand that's you want to get to the a better understanding of what the issue actually is. You need to know what you're dealing with. And the only way you can do that is by testing enough people to find out that. And that's important. Absolutely. It is now. So let me we continue. shall see, you know, you see where that goes, but I think it's, again, it's, you, you know, if, if that had happened, you know, if they'd kept going, how many more people are you going to hear? Would you have heard about, you know? Yeah. And I think you will hear about a bunch anyway. Like I said, right now, the numbers are lower than they well, could be I just, just because gotta, you have I mean, them. speaking of this, just as we're talking here, I just got a notification that Christian Wood of the Detroit Pistons um, has contracted the virus. Sure. Right. So I, I think you're going to, you know, I mean, it also came out that none of the Raptors tested positive after their trip to Utah. Yeah. It's going to be but, a good miss thing. You, you know, you. I mean, it's almost like, that's what the sports story is going to be for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Is who's got it and who doesn't. Yeah. But I also think it's going to, as the numbers go up, I think there's going to be less and less and less of a shock factor with names and all that. At a certain point, you're not going to be like individually naming, you know, the, the, the 14th man on a roster. You're not, it's not going to be as big, but right now in the early stage where there's only a handful of NBA players, if the 14th no, sure. man on, sure. on a roster will get named because it's like, oh, this other person, this blah, blah, blah. And that's to be expected. So there's two more here that I want to talk about specifically because, like I said, each sports league and thing differs slightly in how this is going to impact them. So let's talk about this one. Um, March Madness has been canceled. And um, it was very interesting because the NCAA, the whole NCAA thing was funny because Stephen A. Smith, I've enjoyed, has really gone off on the NCAA because – this is one of those ones where they're amateur athletes. Uh, and realistically, if I was an amateur athlete in it, yes, you want to play March Madness. Yes, you want to get exposure. Yes, it's a huge opportunity for you. But it's, I'm, not, I'm not getting paid for this. You know, I'm not making a dime to go and play this. And you're making billions of dollars on it. And then you were trying desperately your best to try to run this anyway. 
um, potentially at risk to me. It's like, what the heck? I'm not here for this. What are you trying to do? Yeah, it's. I can't give the answer. It was funny because I, and I'm glad actually that Stephen A. Smith has gone off on them because I'm not giving them a pass for anything. The NCAA would have hung on as long as is humanly possible up until the last minute, even though conference tournaments were getting canceled and different states were saying like, yeah, we can't have uh, gatherings of this size, so you weren't going to have full arenas. So they, but they were trying. If they could have stretched this out even longer, the NCAA would have tried. And that is a, a damning statement about this organization that already is shady to begin with. Yeah, for sure. So that was, uh, that was a thing. And then the one that I would say is most directly related to kind of the way we, the stuff we've been talking about on this podcast lately, uh, the Major League Baseball has postponed uh, the start of the regular season. And right now the spring training is off um, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. Because if you send players home it, and then eventually you reset, Major League Baseball is lucky in the sense that the regular season hasn't even started. So they've got a window here to wait a while, and then they can potentially get going, even with a truncated season. It, it's happened before. You can do it. Uh, just reschedule things. Um, and you can wait a while and take a break if you need to. But the issue it creates is, okay, so you postpone it. How long can you postpone it before it becomes a problem, before you uh, endanger the regular season even happening? And then also at the same time, if you do decide, okay, great, we can make do with a 100-game season or 120-game season or whatever, we'll cut off a good chunk there. Then do we have to like reset spring training? Do we need a couple of weeks where they where the pitchers stretch out their arms for a couple of weeks because they didn't get that? They weren't they were starting to get in that direction, but they weren't quite there yet. Yeah, or or hitters that aren't going to have their timing as well too. Yeah, so it's going to have an impact no matter what, and that's the thing. It's like no matter how you do it or however long it takes, even if they're able to play the season or not. There's going to be a bit of a delay there. There's a, there's going to be a, a little bit of an early impact, even if and when you get back to games. So we'll see what happens with that. And I mean, obviously, they've said what I think they're they're aiming for April 9th. Is that right? That is the right target. Now? That is a target. But I'll be honest with you, no chance, zero no, percent. I don't chance. think I don't think it's going to happen either. Yeah, because pretty much the state of New York is is basically shut down. Like, okay, so you want to play the you want to play the season? Can, can we do it without the Yankees and the Mets? Yeah, and then exactly. insert, and then the state of California is going to have is, is having its own issues. You want to do it without the Mariners and the Angels. Now, in fairness, the Angels are irrelevant, but the but there are other teams in the Bay Area and all that. But their like, foosball team is not Carlos phenomenal. The foosball team that right there hurts me more than anything else, Dave. The foosball team that mm, oh, that hurts. That you, you just hit me where I live, Dave. Hit me where I live. Sorry, man. Yeah. But uh, but no, the thing is, like, you imagine. So these are some of the more populous states with a bunch of teams in it. And uh, you're like, yeah, about that. No. So, yeah, so Major League Baseball, sure, Major League Baseball, you want to run with, uh, with you know, a 20-team league like the old days? Because that's about what you'd be looking at. And um, travel will be an issue because right now, even in Canada itself, they're basically like, yeah, don't travel. Don't do that. That thing, don't do it. Yeah, no, and now it's looking. I mean, obviously, no one's announced anything, but it's it's quite potential that um, inter country flights are going to start getting canceled, right? Or, or you know, they're going to say, "Hey, you can't fly inter country." For sure, exactly. And so, so it's one of those things. Like you have to factor all those in. Some of these leagues didn't make the decision because they're being proactive. I would say the NBA, as much as any other one, was trying to be proactive. And then when it became the moment, the second that a single player uh, contracted it, it was done. So it was like a smooth move. That's why I say like it happened really fast on Wednesday because they immediately went to yeah, postponed. It wasn't even a debate because you can't you can't drag your heels on that. And the other aspect of it is that even when you make that decision, then you have to consider like, okay, what's the downstream impact? And now, um, it's because there's two more topics I want to talk about here, and we'll get back to the NBA now. Um, one of them is the downstream impact, because now you have all the workers in the arena who have nothing to do. And right. Now, luckily, um, a lot of people have come out and said that they're going to help support that, right? Yeah, which is um, wise. You know, so you have individual players. That have said that. I know um, Gobert has said that. Kevin Love. Kevin Love, right? He's donated um, some money. And a couple others. And Mark Cuban um, is committed to trying to figure something out for the Dallas Mavericks and uh, Dallas Arena folks. Uh, yeah, there, and there were a couple of places that said that they're going to uh, they're going to pay everybody. Chicago, Chicago was one of them that we're going to get all the arena workers. I can't remember what the other one was, but I definitely Chicago was on that list. There's a handful of them. I would say though, and this is outside of that. So good, good on some of these players volunteering uh, to donate their money uh, to try to help, which I think is a good gesture. 
Uh, no question. Uh, Rudy Gobert, I'll give him credit for it because uh, he, because he he donated five hundred thousand, which is kind of like a forgive me, everybody. Uh, <laughs> you know, trying to buy his way out of some of the flack he's getting right now. Um, Kevin Love donated a hundred thousand, and he, you know, he's not on the hook, but for anybody, but it was a good gesture uh, for him to, you know, come out and say, "Hey, I'll I'll happily donate." But you know, and one of the criticisms, not of the players, but one of the criticisms, like really, the owners are the billionaires. How about you just pay your own damn uh, employees? <laughs> it's not a, it's not a big thing. The, well, I mean, and you've seen that, like. Um... For example, I'm not going to go through everything because yeah. I have a, a list here in front of me of what, what they're doing sort yeah. of um, team by team, right? Yep. But like Atlanta Hawks has announced they're going to continue to pay full and part-time staff. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Chicago Bulls owners confirmed they're going to pay everybody uh, what they would have gotten paid for the regular season. Yep. You know, you heard about Kevin Love. You just spoke about Mark Cuban. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blake Griffin donated $1, $100,000 to help uh, workers at Little Caesars Arena. Yep. Uh, I'm not going to go again. I'm not going to go through everybody, but you can see that, you know, more and more teams are uh, jumping on the bandwagon. Sorry, I should mention since it's, uh, you know, my boy, uh, Zion has announced that he's going to uh, cover the salaries of all Pelicans Arena staff for the first 30 days of the NBA break. Which I think is a very good gesture. But again, it leads me back to my my point wasn't that there are no owners or no ownership groups that are doing this. My point not is enough of them. my point well, is that, that they should just step up and say, Hey, we're doing it. Yeah. It shouldn't be the players. It's my point. Uh, Zion is a rookie. He, he, why is Zion paying for the arena staff for 30 days? It's a great gesture. And I think it's wonderful that Zion has taken it upon himself to do this, but why isn't the Pelicans owner doing it? That should you know, be the person who's doing it. That makes more sense to me. Zion right now is still a baby in the NBA. He hasn't earned the, be- the monster dollars that a lot of players have with their big shoe contracts and all. But again, I'm not looking to the players. Why are the players paying this out? Because because they they've earned their money, um, and the owners have much more of that money, and it is their arenas that these people are working in. So it's one of those things where it's like I feel like you, Mister Billionaire Man, shouldn't be relying on your employees to pay other employees. Yeah, it's kind of a weird look, is what I'm trying to say. No, absolutely, I yeah. hear you, and I and I totally agree with you. Yeah, so that's kind of an interesting you know sub t- subplot to a lot of this. And um, I'll give you uh, now it falls outside of the world of sports proper, but I'll give you kind of another I want to finish on kind of a lighthearted note, Dave. So let's do this. I'm going to give you a little bit of an anecdote. So let's oh, talk. Can about- I, since we're still talking, can I mention my example? Go ahead. Yeah. Before go before we get to the lightheartedness. Go ahead. Because this is like a shame, shame, shame kind of thing. All right. Go. Um, soccer in England. What the hell? They were adamant that they were going to play and they were going to continue to play. And and Thursday they said we're gonna play. Yep. Right. And and they said, hey, you know, the government says it's okay. Uh, rugby's still playing, and rugby is still playing, as far as I know. Uh, then it came out that the Arsenal manager uh, has had contracted COVID nineteen, mm-hmm. possibly from the contact he had with the owner of Olympiacos. Uh, right. They put basically the first team in isolation. Excuse me. Right. So the, the first team, meaning like the you know their starters and the main players, yep, uh, in isolation after that, and they didn't they postponed their game on Wednesday, but they're like you know what everything's fine, we're gonna play on Saturday, and then it's like oh actually well now that you know a big name has it, uh, we're actually gonna cancel the season and all football in England, and it's like so much egg on your face, like the writing was on the wall. Why do you have to be stubborn and insist that this is gonna happen? Just. I would say, so this is a broader discussion. And you know what, Dave? Uh, Make a note somewhere if you can. Uh, I'd like to have a little bit of a broader discussion on the real business model of the sports leagues because it plays into this. So, But long story short. I'm making the note as we speak. Beautiful. But long story short, the note that I would make on that is that right now a lot of these leagues and teams operate on, they make a ton of money. Let's let's make this abundantly clear. They make a ton of money. But there's a difference between earning revenue and earning profit. Are some of these teams extraordinarily profitable? Yes, they are. But some of these uh, leagues and teams operate on this idea where, like, we'll keep spending money to make money, and then they they can plead poverty because some of these owners also own so many businesses. You use the sports team to run it at a loss. So then all of a sudden, uh, when it comes time where you're going to miss some revenue, you're, like, freaking out because you've already transferred funds to other businesses. And it's playing the shell game with your funds, but you don't want to bring the funds back because then it hurts your other business, which is your main business, as opposed to the sports thing, which is almost your hobby. So you want to make money on your hobby, but at the same time, you can't acknowledge and accept that sometimes if you run it on a thin line of profitability, then it would take very little to throw you off and suddenly put you in the red. 
and that's where a lot, I think a lot of these leagues were like, "Oh crap! If we miss games and we're not making this money, we're, we're we've got we've got a problem." And that's where like the NBA and those kinds of leagues are are paying close attention and struggling a little bit with it because the fact the longer the NBA thing is postponed, or if they cancel the season, they have to pay back some of that TV money. And in turn, this is a broader discussion, but whatever TV money they give back. That's part of the profitability of the league as a whole, and it affects the salary cap. Yes, and every that league is, that, is, that, that there are potential major salary in, cap implications here. That's right. For every league that has a salary cap that is tied in any way to revenues, a drop in revenues means the salary cap goes down, which means then you suddenly have to respond. And the NHL is also in the same boat because they have an escrow system. So then it's like, well, do the players have to pay back money? It depends on how far the revenue drops. Um, you know, what's the minimum threshold? This is this is a very complicated conversation. We won't go into all of that today, but I'm saying these are things to consider that these teams are going, the longer this goes off, the more problematic the math will become. And then the lawyers will have to get involved because it's like, well, this isn't our fault. So we should get some of the money. Oh, well, we think you should get this. And then that negotiation back and forth. So that's kind of important. Yeah. You have to consider. And it'll, yeah. Those, I mean, there's a lot of unresolved issues for a lot of leagues that are going to come out of this and obviously we'll eventually get those answers. But, you know, for right now, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And one more thing I'll mention before I get to the lighthearted point, since we brought it up, is that one of the league that we'll have to consider, and we'll talk about this more next week, because like I said, we're going to need content, so we're going to, so we'll save this one. But uh, another league to consider is the NFL. Even though they got their season done, the Super Bowl was able to be played and completed before this fully fell down. Um, they ha the CBA is going to end next year, but they were well on their way to negotiating this year. And the, some of the players didn't like the, the proposed CBA, which would be like a 10 or 11 year agreement. And all that is related to it. But now at the same time, now you have to reconsider the climate because if the economy gets hurt and in terms of the team make less money, locking in those guarantees now for CBA for like 10 years might be the prudent move. Whereas before you could have tried to play a little more hardball. So that's I'm saying there's some downstream impact there, even for leagues that aren't currently playing that you're not thinking about. No, for sure. For so sure. But as you said, we will we will bring this into more in depth conversation on those issues next week. Yeah, there'll be plenty to talk about, I think, from that perspective. All right, let's do a little lightheartedness. You ready for it, Dave? I'm ready. All right, let's talk WWE. My personal my personal favorite. I don't watch it as much as I used to, but I used to be a huge wrestling fan. And I used to watch all the shows. And I'll give you just for context, there was a time period in the late 90s and the early 2000s where you could watch, uh, you know, WWE, then WWF. I prefer to call it that, but fine, WWE. So you used to have the show on Monday, and then in TSN in Canada, uh, you would had Monday Nitro for WCW. That would air on Tuesday afternoon after school and after work and all that. That would air on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, you'd have another show. On Thursday, you'd have a show. And on Friday, it was ECW. So if you were a wrestling fan, you could basically watch a show on a network every single day of the week there in the late 90s for a little stretch of time. And the ratings were good and all that was happening and there was a lot going on. But over the years, it's become less and less interesting to me. I'll still kind of peer in from time to time to see what's going on. But um, in reaction to a lot of this, uh, they still ran the SmackDown show on Friday. And what they did is they still ran it live, but they ran it from the Performance Center, which is in, uh, which is in Orlando, Florida. And they have a little mini arena inside of the Performance Center in Orlando, Florida, and they ran the show. And this is where I was going to say the lightheartedness, Dave, because what they did is they actually ran the show kind of like normal, but with a stripped down crew and obviously with no crowd. Um, and basically you had the cameras moving around and you're looking, but you're looking at literally empty seats. So, that, so they had it lit up and then you had the uh, wrestlers come in and do their theme song and everything. And, and the thing is they were wrestling the matches. And they were still playing up to the crowd that wasn't there. I love it. Like fully aware of, of the absurdity of what they were doing. And they even did uh, promos in the, in, the, in the ring where they're doing a promo. And, um, a couple of the, and a couple of the wrestlers there, if you're familiar with them, John Morrison and The Miz, if you can Google them. But they, they had a promo where they were antagonizing the crowd and reacting as though the crowd was reacting to them. And they still did it exactly that way. So they said, I like it. If you don't think we're the best champions, then speak now. And obviously there's no crowd. They say, like, you see, we're right. So they were doing the whole playoff and they were doing taunts. And then there were wrestlers who were doing taunts to the crowd and the whole bit. And you just watch it, uh, looking at it on television. I watched clips of it on YouTube and I'm like, this is the most absurd thing I've ever seen. Like they're doing the whole bit. They're doing taunting. It's like, yes, you keep taunting that person that isn't there in the crowd. That empty chair. And on the commentary, uh, they were aware of this, so they would tongue-in-cheek throw some references in 
because they had one of the wrestlers, you know, sneak in for an attack. And it's like, oh, she blended in with the crowd. I didn't see her. <laughs> I'm just like, good job, guys. I like it. I appreciate I like the it. absurdity of it. But I want you to consider that. To have that visual in your mind. Imagine someone doing a performance that depends on crowd interaction with no crowd. It's one of those things where it just uh, where it just goes down that way, and you have to play with it what it is. So that's kind of your life. But I mean, <laughs> I didn't watch it. I kind of wish I did because that would have been quite. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. You can check it out. I'll send you a link. Please do, and please post one in the uh, comments for the listeners as well. Yeah, I'll put a clip in there uh, because WWE has their YouTube channel, and they put all the stuff, a bunch of clips on there, and I'll, I'll send it to you. And it'll it'll be weird to you to see someone trying to do this in an empty arena and responding to a crowd that isn't there. I love it. I anxiously, well, maybe not anxiously, but I, I wait it because, you know what, I have no crazy weird stats to go by this week as we have in the previous week, so you got to have some kind of entertainment somewhere. Yeah. And I think that'll be the point that I'll take everybody away on. The world hasn't ended. Life will go on. It is going to operate in a modified format. A lot of it is going to be based on how you d you decide to treat the next while. Um, it's not going to be big crowds. It's not going to be a lot of those things. But that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy yourself, You know, better yourself, do things. Read a book. Watch a movie that you haven't had the chance to watch. There's going to be plenty of them. Maybe you haven't watched them all. Do some of that. Um, you know, hang out, hang out with your family at home. Whatever the case is going to be, there are some opportunities there to still live your life and do the best you can with it. Um, and then take uh, enjoyment in the little lighthearted moments on there because there are still some. And uh, still things are going to keep operating. Yeah, exactly. Very good. So we'll leave you with that. Uh, no big send off in this case. What we're looking forward to is when we can go back to talking to regular sports conventionally. So that'll be what we're looking forward to. Uh, when that's going to happen, we don't know, but we will be back for another episode next week. Uh, we'll figure out what the format is between now and then. It'll be the usual yep. thing. Exactly. Good. So for myself and Dave, uh, we thank you for listening. Uh, last point we'll make is that you can check us out on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. There's going to be an archived version of this with uh, cartoon versions of our faces on YouTube if you go to Unnecessary Nonsense Podcast. So you can check us out on those and uh, you know listen to all of our podcasts because you've got nothing better to do. So that'll be it for us. We'll catch you in the next episode of the Unnecessary Nonsense Podcast.